and disposable incomes are all at some of the worst levels of performance that we've seen uh, since World War II. Now, this is very important because that's 70% of our GDP, right? And so 70% of our GDP is at a very, very low level of performance, and that's stuck in the households. I'm going to tell you a little bit why, what that is, while about 20% of our GDP, which is in businesses, is actually thriving, but that's not enough to pull us forward. The result of all that is, is in every recovery from a recession since the Great Depression, we have gotten back to trend growth. In other words, what typically happens is your economy goes down by some amount, and then it bounces back. If you have a steep decline, you have a steep rebound, like following the Great Depression. If you have a shallow decline, you have a shallow rebound, like following the uh, dot-com crash in 2001. What we've experienced here is a steep decline and a shallow recovery. And the result of that is that we've lost about a trillion dollars of potential output. So we have about a $15 trillion GDP, and if we'd gotten back to trend growth, it would be closer to $16 trillion. And if we grow one percentage point less uh, over the coming 10 years than we would otherwise, then that will be another trillion dollars loss of potential output in our economy, which is a very, very large number. Why is that? The reason for that, um, Dean, you mind if I walk around a little bit rather than stand up here? Is that okay? Good. My mother's afraid I'm going to trip and break the other wrist. Um, <laughs> but uh, the reason for that is that we experienced something at the peak of, economic, in peak of economic output, which was Q3 2007, uh, our economy had borrowed across all sectors of our society an amount of debt equal to 350% of GDP. Over the course of American history, we've had kept debts at about 100 to 100%, 100 to 120% of GDP. Starting in 1980 and going from 1980 to 2007, we increased the debt in our society by three and a half fold as compared to our economic output. We went from 100% of GDP to 350% of GDP. The, the, oh, there's only one other time in American history when we've had numbers that high. That was during the period, the, the depth of the Great Depression. And that was not because we added more debt during that time period, but, but because the economy collapsed. And so the debt as a percent of GDP went way up. But that was a measure of economic distress. This, by the way, is my classmate from Harvard Business School. Am I doing OK, George? You're surprised. Oh, OK, good. Thanks, pal. Um, Section F, right? Section F. You got it. All right. The, um, the, um, but where was I? No. The, um, the 350% we uh, accumulated between 19 and 2007 occurred at the peak of our economic performance. That's a very, very different thing than having debt that mounts as a result of financial distress. And that resulted from every sector of our society borrowing money to consume and taking economic performance from the future and into today, now the past. And now we got to pay it back. People ask me, you know, isn't the economy, doesn't the economy sort of have the flu? You know, doesn't it, we, didn't we sort of, you know, we have a couple of years of maybe 15, 18 months of, of recession, and then we go right back to kind of where we were before. I said, no, the way to think about this economic recovery is that we have um, diabetes, right? We're 350 pounds overweight, we have a chronic and we're going to have to spend years of careful management of our, uh, all aspects of our economy in order to get to have a chance to be successful again. And if you look at it, by the way, a lot of people want to demonize, vilify, whatever word you use, the business community or the financial services community. It turns out that's where the least amount of debt is. By far, the biggest amount of debt is at the household level. We're at the end of 20 to 30 years of Americans borrowing. Americans took about 50% of the value of our homes. We went from an equity content of the average American home at 80% down to about 30%. And we bought fat panel TVs for the dens, filled our closets full of clothes we didn't need, new appliances in the, in the kitchen, new, rent, new cars in the driveways, and we just consumed our seed corn. We are today with a massive amount of debt. The second place the debt built up was at the government level. It's continuing to build up, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. But during, the period of the, during this period, Republicans and Democrats alike that was a, uh, agreed that it was a really good thing for people to own homes. Uh, and Americans went out and borrowed m money at levels never seen before to purchase homes they couldn't afford. And, that, and by the way, the two government agencies that abetted that, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, will be the two places the U.S. government loses money from it during the period as a result of the crash of 2008. All other money that came from the TARP will be paid back at a profit. All the money the Federal Reserve Bank invested uh, will be paid back at a profit. We'll lose somewhere between 175 and 200 billion dollars on 
the investments in mortgages that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac created. So the government and the households are the two places where it was the epicenter of this if you look at the data. Now, it turns out that this is It turns out that um, just like, uh, you know, raising, I say raising kids who think they've discovered things their parents didn't know anything about, uh, but it turns out we were teenagers one time too and we kind of have a good view of what that was all about. It turns out that this is an um, a, a, uh, episode, an experience that's repeated over and over again for 700 years. There's an economist friend of mine who's, done, who's researched this. He's gone back through 700 years of economic history. And what happens is that the country that gets to the peak of economic performance, that's the most powerful country in the world, begins, begins to borrow to consume, in creating an asset bubble inflation that when underlying economic performance can support the underlying uh, asset values, asset values collapse. But since debt is a fixed claim, it doesn't go away. So the debt's remaining, but the asset values are gone. Then, uh, and then, the, then what the government does is the government steps in and it substitutes government borrowing and government consumption, think stimulus, for private borrowing and private consumption until the governments can't borrow anymore and then you have a financial debt, so you have a sovereign debt crisis, think Europe. And then what happens is the, is the sovereign borrows money from its own banks to fund its own debt, uh, debt and then it brings the banks down themselves down and, that, and those countries go into collapse and new ones uh, take their place, think China. All right, this has happened over and over again for 700 years of economic history. And the question is, are we going to be the first country in the country to kind of avoid that, that fix? Now, what happens is that, it, but, but that's the bad news. The good news is it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're going, we're going recession somehow as a result of all this. What it, look at those countries that have been through this experience over 700 years is that if they grew 3%, which is about what the United States grew before the period of the collapse, the financial collapse, they grow 2% afterwards, which is kind of what our performance has been. And if they had about 3% unemployment uh, for the period uh, before the uh, collapse, they have about 8% persistently going forward. So my operating assumption, which has proven to be reasonably accurate over the course of the first three years of this recession, uh, this recovery, pardon me, has been 2% growth and 8% unemployment. And if someone thinks, oh, we're going back into a double-dip recession, got all these sort of issues, I think they're wrong. And, I'm, and then I'm the optimist because I say, no, it's steady growth, high unemployment, but steady, slow growth. And if they think, no, markets are telling us that um, economic performance is getting ready to do this handoff to the consumer, we're going to have this magical liftoff, we're going to go back to 3 or 4% growth. By the way, when was the last time Georgia United States economy grew at 4%? Bill Clinton was president. Right? So this notion that we're going to have 4% growth is really kind of illusory. Uh, then they are too optimistic and I'm the pessimist. So think about the base case here as being 2% growth and 8% unemployment for a very long period of time. Why is that? Because the, uh, the sectors where the financial crisis was generated have structural imbalances that are going to, that simply require time to get through. We now have about, on average, um, the supply of real estate. Let's talk about real estate. So the two main places where that imbalance was generated was in real estate and in consumer spending and consumer debt. So let's talk about those for a minute. If you look at the real estate sector, on average, in a period of recovery, by the way, there are two, two things she's looking at my shoes. One, I could not figure out how to get my socks on with one hand. So I apologize, I don't have any socks. I just couldn't figure that part out. Um, the, uh, that's summer, right? August, it's okay, right? Um, the, uh, the, um, where was I, Kim? Oh, yeah, the, the, um, so, usually in a period of recovery from a recession, real estate spending increases by 26% in that year. In the recovery from the 1982-83 recession, real estate spending increased by 75% because that was the steepest, the steepest, uh, uh, decline we had seen, so you had the steepest rebound. In this recovery so far, for the first two years, real estate spending has gone down, and this year it's up only 4% so far. So when people tell you the housing market has recovered, it's now back to the, the kind of levels, don't believe me. What we basically got is we've finally eaten through this inventory of homes of which we built too many. Uh, we still haven't gotten through the backlog of four homes. And there's a relatively predictable, I was talking to Dean about sort of algorithms, there's a relatively predictable algorithm you can run about how many foreclosed homes are going to come on the market, how many homes are delinquent are going to be foreclosed, how many homes are underwater are going to be delinquent and then foreclosed. And if you look at all that, 
what you can see is there's about another year to a year and a half of excess inventory of real estate that has to come on the market. Now, it doesn't seem, it seems like relatively, if you run the numbers, you can figure it out that it doesn't look like it's going to depress economic activity, but it's not going to be a generator for economic activity until that gets absorbed. And that's about another year to year and a half. Okay? And that's a very, very important part of kind of our driving our economy forward. But consumer spending is 70% of GDP, as I said earlier. And consumer spending is generated in two ways. One is as a result of people having jobs and having income to spend. And the second is as a result of people having income, having net worth, having money in the bank, value of their homes, value of their stocks and bonds. By the way, um, we are now at a period because the housing market has, has been so stagnant and the equity markets have risen, we're now at the first time in American history where more Americans' value is in the value of their stocks than in the value of their homes for the first time in American history because of a long period of stagnation of housing prices while, while corporate profits have been good and equities have gone up. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, take a step back. The, how, the employment markets have some very, very serious structural flaws to them today, which means there's going to be a very meaningful time before we can get anywhere back to the kind of full employment. So the simple math uh, is that at 2% economic growth, you create just enough new jobs, about 150,000 per month, to, bring, to, get, to allow people like you when you graduate to be absorbed in the workforce, but not enough to reduce unemployment. All right, so at 2% growth, you make no change. It's almost impossible to make any change in unemployment. It, at 2.5% growth, to get back to 25% unemployment, so 5% unemployment would take us about 25 years. At 3% growth, it would take us about 15 years. Right? And so the unemployment levels uh, are going to remain very high. And some of that is because we have unemployment problems. We have a significant decline that's occurring in what's called the employment to population ratio, so people are dropping out of the labor force. If we had the same amount of people in the labor force today as we had in 2008, unemployment would not be 8.2%, but it would be about 11.5%. But So people have just given up and are dropping out of the labor force. That's not a healthy way to get your unemployment levels down, obviously. The long-term unemployment, which is people unemployed more than 26 weeks, is at levels never seen before. Uh, and after you've been unemployed for more than 26 weeks, you lose connection to the labor force, you lose skills. If you're a salesman, you lose relationships. And by the way, if you're unemployed more than a year, your children in their lives persistently have less good education, health care, and income outcomes. You think about it, because they, they get brought up in very different kind of circumstances as a result of your long-term persistent unemployment. So long-term unemployment, people unemployed for a long time period, is at, is, at, is at its peak in American history because there are a lot of people who are in construction, men who are in construction and manufacturing, and, those, and in particular in the manufacturing area, there's jobs, those jobs aren't coming back. They don't have college education, they don't have technical skills, they're not going to get employed. It's a very important thing. If you look at today, our, the other thing that's happened is our education system has failed us. If you look today at the applicants per job opening, if you want a job in farming or forestry, there are 50 people lined up for every job opening. If you want a job in um, building maintenance, there are 20 people lined up for every job. If you want a job in computer sciences, there are 0.4 applicants per job, and even less for biotech. At the very depth of the recession, there are 157,000 job openings in computer science that couldn't be filled because we hadn't trained them. Right? Now, one of the things I think is very good about where you students are and what you're being trained to do is we need you. You're going to be employed about this. The, the things that you do are the important growing entrepreneurial parts of our economy, so this is not a message for you. But as you think about the communities you live in or the communities you go out to when you, gra when you graduate from school, we need to refocus. So in my community in Rye, New York, which has these great schools, one of my friends called me up and said, we're raising a million and a half dollars for the um, high school, public high school. I said, great, I'm in. What are you going to do? After school programs, math and science teachers, laboratories. No, we're going to put turf on the foot and lights on the football field. I said, no. Not only am I not going to do that, I'm going to criticize to everybody I talk to. Because that you have your values in the wrong place. You think the people in China are thinking about turf and lights on the football field? No, they're sending their kids to school to study math and science to get ahead. Just like you guys are doing here. But take a step back. Um, huge underlying structural problems in our economy, lack of skills, 
uh, particularly expressed in people who are middle-aged men who used to work uh, without training, who used to work in um, brute jobs. And those are, by the way, being replaced by jobs that are lower wage, higher education, and more female-oriented jobs, nursing and education and social service. A lot also the nature of work in the United States is fundamentally changing. And by the way, I think we'll see that the nature of the households will fundamentally change as the, as the women are increasingly the, bread, the breadwinners in the households and the men are increasingly unemployable and hard to retrain. But anyway, that's another step. Take that back. So if you think about the income side of the balance sheet, of the, of the, sort of the, the consumer spending equation, that's not coming back anytime soon. Right, and so there was this period a couple of months uh, in which um, consumer spending went up substantially and consumer incomes had continued to stagnate and the people in Washington were celebrating, we're past this thing, and I went to talk to anybody who couldn't say this is not sustainable and you've seen it's come back down again. So in people who, who live on their incomes to consume, to consume have continue to have very high uh, degrees of uh, insecurity in the households and very, very, and muted consumption patterns. In fact, as I alluded to earlier, they're actually paying down debt and reducing their consumption. That's exactly the opposite thing you need during a period when you want a recovery, but it's also healthy for the long term. You look, on the other hand, if you look at the asset side of the spending equation, people who've been in the markets, as the markets have improved, people whose bet wealth is primarily in stocks and also bonds, have done very well. So Walmart is swooning, but Tiffany's is, is uh, kind of um, thriving, in that kind of world we're in. But don't be misled by that, because from the peak to today, household net worth across the United States is $7 trillion less than it was at the time, at the peak in 2000. Most economists, seven to eight, depending on who's doing the counting, most economists think that Americans spend something called the wealth effect. They spend about 5% of, of their household wealth on, in consumption every year. So if you think about seven to eight billion dollars gone, 5%, what's that? 5%, 78 billion dollars? 350 billion. billion dollars. Okay, good. Uh, so about 350 to 400 billion dollars of consumption is lost almost permanently. Unless, except if you think the value of those homes that are driving the net, the net worth of most, of most American households is going to go up substantially and replace all that, which I think is unlikely. So that's a picture from the household and why, uh, while we're not in decline, we're not likely to get back to the levels of growth that we've experienced in the past. Now, let's switch for a second to the government activities. We had, in 2009, the most robust public policy response to a recession ever. We spent more money. We printed more money. Uh, we, rate, we reduced interest rates by the largest amount. And we kept this thing from falling apart. I think it was a terrific idea. But now we're living with the aftermath of that. Right? And there are a couple pieces to it. One on the fiscal side, uh, we are now running, we are now projected to run a current policy budget deficits of $12 trillion over the next 10 years. Look at that, $12 trillion. Um, that, all, you know, you've heard all this stuff about Simpson Bowles. You know, Erskine's a good friend of mine, and a lot of people here know him. I think it's a great contribution he made. All that does is take $4 trillion out of the 12 to make it $8 trillion. And a certain assumptions for economic growth causes the debt as a percent of GDP to stabilize. And by the way, if you get debt in your economy over 100% of GDP for a persistent period of time, your economy grows an additional percentage point less for that time period because you have to, you have to service debt rather than invest and consume. The, so the Simpson-Bowles thing is an absolutely critical thing to do. But as a result of the dysfunctionality in Washington, we're now facing something people have, I've been raising alarms about for, for a year now, and it's finally something that people are, for, are, are uh, kind of starting to kind of learn and think about called the fiscal cliff. Anybody here know what the fiscal cliff is? People heard a little about the fiscal cliff? That's interesting. You guys got to, in addition to your textbooks, you got to read the Wall Street Journal <laughs> every day, okay? Make me that promise. Anyway, so as a result of the operation of current law, 3.5 to 4% of government spend, 3.5% of GDP in the form of government spending is reduced, is, is taken out of our economy on January 1st. The sequester, you know, when they had the super committee and they failed to act and they had $900 billion of spending hit automatically. The repeal of the Bush tax cuts, 
the end of uh, extended unemployment insurance and the end of the payroll tax holiday all add up to about 3 to 5 to 4 percent of GDP. That would be catastrophic if all of a sudden taking your diabetic patient who's, you know, got 100 pounds down but still got 250 to go and say, go run a marathon. You know, we're not ready for that level of withdrawal. On the other hand, we absolutely have to present to the world, to our trading partners, to our people who finance us, to our markets, a, a reliable plan to get our debts down as a percent of GDP. We cannot borrow $12 trillion in the next 10 years. The markets will not, will not allow that, and we will become Greece. Most economists think the United States has about 10 to 15 years of fiscal capacity left, but at some point if we keep consuming and borrowing and not paying taxes and not reforming our health care system, reforming Social Security and not taking a whack out of the defense spending and not doing all the things we need to do to make government operate better to reduce discretionary spending, we will have too much as a percent of GDP. The markets will not finance us and we'll be in the kind of crisis Europe's facing today. And we have to get that done. Think we can do it? I do believe that all the politicians in Washington, and I am raising alarm about this forever, are, are going to get something done, but they won't get it done until after the election because they're litigating today in the election this notion of should we have the components of what we do be more in the way of tax increases or more in the way of spending cuts. That's a good debate to have, but they're also playing chicken with the economy because they know we've got this big fiscal cliff out there, and they only have 29 working days between the election and January 1st to solve a problem that's 35 to 4% of our GDP. It's not going to happen at all, and if it does happen in some modest way, it'll be incredibly ugly as they go through one, as they put, put the markets on a thrill ride. So there's some chances that push it off another six months. That's a great idea, right? Let's just push it off six months. There, probably what will happen. That's a big problem. The second thing we have today is we have created a huge amount of money. We've printed a huge amount of money in order to finance our economy through this time period. And the Federal Reserve is engaged in a bunch of policies, largely around the area of quantitative easing. Uh, and that presents, many people think, a very significant risk of long-term inflation. Because if you have a fixed supply of goods and you have a lot of money to spend for those goods, that means you know, one divided by the other means prices go way up. Right now, there's too much slack in the economy to um, uh, cause inflation. But if we're not careful about this huge amount of money that we've created uh, and, try and rein in at the right point, and these are debates happening right now in Washington, we do have the risk of long-term inflation, which is something to be very worried about. Now, I'm going to end on a positive note. Um, which is that, remember, I said 2% growth, 8% un unemployment. I didn't say zero growth. I didn't say recession. Right? And that's actually not a bad place to be. The Europeans would love that deal, by the way, today. They'd love to have that deal in front of them. But also remember that growth is an average. My wife, used, uh, Kevin said I was a little bit involved with basketball. You know, for a while, the tallest guy in the NBA was Chinese, Yao Ming, but most Chinese are pretty short. Right? What I mean by that is growth is an average. And what you want to do, you want to spend your life in the part of the economy that's averaging growth up. Right? So you want, and, and what is that? That is technology, pharmaceuticals, and energy, and it's innovation. And it's work by people who are highly educated and highly skilled in the math and the science disciplines. So as you think about developing your career, or the older folks are going to think about where you're going to put your capital. Where you that's where you want to be, and that's one of the reasons why I want to come here tonight, because I want to be amongst who um, are, I think, doing what we need to do to be successful as a country and understand the importance of education, understand the importance of math and science innovation. Now, I'm done here. I'll take